Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this video, I'll be speaking about the bone form and function. We will go rapidly through these objectives, discussing the bone material properties and how these properties and material fits or suits the function of the bone. If we review rapidly the bone functions, we will find that the bone has three main functions the mechanical support, the mineral hemostasis, and its marrow element producing the blood cells. The most important in this presentation that we will concentrate on is how the bone material and properties suits the mechanical support function. Some basic terms that we have to understand before discussing the material properties. Stress. Stress is the force per unit area that's, that is applied to a certain material and is measured in newtons per meter squared. This force will result in a change, a deformation, a change in the height or the shape of a material. And this is what we name a strain and it's measured in percentage. It's a ratio between the original to the change. Different materials respond in different ways to the force applied. Some materials are elastic, so they deform a lot with low stresses applied. However, other materials are brittle, for example, so they need a huge force and the, that results in a sudden failure or sudden fracture. The relationship between the stress and the deformations that happen in a certain material is plotted against, against each other in what we name the stress-strain curve. The ratio between the stress and the strain is usually what we name Young's modulus of elasticity of a certain material. This is a simple graph showing different modulus of elasticities of different materials that we usually use in orthopedic surgery. Going back to our material, bone on the, micro, on the microscopic level or the gross picture, we have two types of bone. Cortical, which is the compact bone composed of a compact lamellae with low porosity, and the cancellous or the spongy bone which, which is composed of a loosely arranged rod, rods and struts with very high porosity. So that's the two types of bone that we have on a gross level. If we look at the cancellous bone or the spongy bone, we will find that it has a low modulus of elasticity. That means it deforms rapidly to low stresses. And that's why it's located in the epiphysis to deform and act as a shock absorber, protecting the overlying cartilage from forces exerted, taking most of the forces and deforming, preventing these forces from reaching the cartilage and causing injury. While the cortical bone modulus of elasticity is high, it responds by low deformation to high stresses and that's why we will find that the cortical bone is located either on the metaphysis or the epiphysis as a cortical shell surrounding or covering the trabecular bone taking the force spreading it across a huge surface area of the trabecular bone or in the diaphysis working as a load sharing or a road bearing device or material. Bone on the microscopic level. Bone is a composite material, and the composite material in physics, it's a combination of two materials having very different properties. When they are combined to, together, they, uh, they work together to give a composite a unique property. Bone is formed of two materials, actually, a soft organic protein material and a hard inorganic or hydroxy appetite crystals. To understand more about the composite material, an example 
that we use, use we, that we see every day is the reinforced concrete. It's composed of, a, of many materials working together to provide a unique property for the reinforced concrete. It's composed of steel wires. wires. This provides, or this works to provide the tensile strength of the material, while the cement, sand, and rock mixture provide the compression strength of the material. Our bone is subjected to different forces coming from different directions, mainly compression, tension, and torsion. So, for simplification, we will compare the bone to the reinforced concrete to understand more how the bone materials act as a composite structure. The reinforced concrete, we said that the steel wires provide the tensile strength of the material. If we look under the microscope, we will find that the collagen or the protein of the bone, which is present in a triple helix structure, they look, they, look, they, they look exactly under the microscope to the tensile wires, providing the tensile strength. If we look under the microscope to the calcium phosphate crystals, we will, look, we will find that they look exactly similar to the concrete under the microscope. Both are there to provide compression strength. So, Inorganic materials as calcium phosphate crystals is there to antagonize the compression forces. Collagen triple helix structure, collagen type 1, is there to antagonize the tensile forces applied to the bone. What about the torsion or the tensional forces? If we look at the ultimate stress or the highest force that the bone can withstand in compression, it's less than 212 newtons per meter. This is the strongest force the cortical bone can withstand. Less for torsional, or less for tension, and very weak for torsion. The ultimate stress for torsion is less than 84 newtons per meter square. This is because the combination of the two composite materials is there to antagonize the torsional force. However, each material is there to antagonize one force for uh, the other two forces. So, bone is weakest in torsion, then tension, and then compression. And that's what, well, what we name an isotopic structure. That means that the bone has different modulus of elasticity depending on the direction of loading. Bone is also a viscoelastic material. That means that it responds differently to the rate of loading. A common example of this while reducing a fracture in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pelvic fracture, for example, if you load the bone rapidly, it doesn't reduce, but it yields with slow loading. And that is because of having an inorganic, and that is because having an in, uh, the, the organic material or the collagen composition. On the microscopic level, we will find that we have two types of bone or stages. The primarily, the woven bone, and the secondary, the well-oriented lamellar bone. Looking under the microscope, the primarily bone is immature, it's rapidly formed, randomly organized and not stress oriented but the secondary bone either cortical or cancellous it's arranged properly in proper lamellae which 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 are stress oriented primarily bone is rapidly formed during to allow for rapid fractured stability and less mineralized to allow for easier re removal during the remodeling process during fracture repair, the fracture hematoma rapidly reorganizes to form and calcifies to form the woven weak bone. This, this, uh, this weak bone provides more stability and less movement at the fracture ends. 
until it reaches absolute stability and what's absolute stability is there the bone starts to reorient itself according to the stresses applied to form the secondary or the lamellar well-oriented bone structure so microscopically the bone is formed of a mineral matrix which is the inorganic matrix constituting about 70 percent of the bone material in the form of calcium phosphate crystals and, the, and, and these materials the, the mineral matrix is there to antagonize the compression forces 25 percent is formed of organic or protein matrix 90 percent is formed from the collagen type 1 material and this is and this material is there to resist the tensile forces however the living thing that we have is the cells and it's responsible for the maintenance and accordingly we have two main types of cells the osteoblasts which is the bone forming cells it forms the organic and the inorganic matrix and it's driven from the marrow and the periosteum stem cells the osteoclasts which is the bone resorbing cells and it's driven from the blood cells and it's a multinucleated giant cells formed by fusion of a mononuclear cells the may the, the osteocytes function is still unclear however we think that it's responsible for the uh, organization of the function of the osteoblast and osteoclasts together the bone is in, is in a continuous dynamic status the process of remodeling is a lifelong process it's there to replace the aged tissues and to meet the mechanical changing demands remodeling remodeling of bone depends on the type of bone on the trabecular bone it's a surface phenomena it happens on the surface by two phases the resorption phase and followed by which is headed by the osteoclastic activity followed by the formation phase which is guided by the osteoblastic activity while on the cortical bone it's a tunneling process in the form of a cutting cones the head of the cones or the tip of the cones is mainly osteoclasts while the tail of the cone is mainly an osteoblast with uh, the nutrient vessels in the middle the regulation of this process the regulation on the balance between the osteoblast and the osteoclast what we name the coupling mechanism this, this is controlled mainly by the osteoblast a stimulus stimulate the osteoblast to secrete a protein the ligand the rank ligand this rank ligand acts or binds to a receptor on the mononuclear cells in the blood that fuses together to form the joint multinucleated osteoclasts. Once this osteoclast is formed, it's active and it starts the resorbing activity. So the bone resorption starts by stimulus for the bone forming cells. Once the resorption is done, this stimulus stops. So the osteoblast secretes the OPG, another protein, which blocks the ligand, and finally stopping the formation of the multinucleated resorbing cells. So the balancing mechanism is under the influence of a different stimuli. For example, the parathyroid hormone it stimulates the osteoblasts to secrete the ligand, stimulating the osteoblo osteo uh, osteoclastic activity and releasing more calcium into the blood. While the sex hormones or the estrogen mainly stimulate the osteoblast to secrete the OPG blocking the bone resorption process. Other stimuli like the calcitonin, they act directly to stimulate the osteoclastic activity. Now, what about the other feedback mechanism, the control of the osteoclasts on the osteoblasts? This is less understood 
But however, we believe that there is a feedback mechanism present between the osteoclastic activity and the osteoblasts. The regulation of bone remodeling. As we said, the bone is a dynamic process in a continuous state of remodeling, in a continuous cha change. This depends on different uh, factors, physiological, like the age, biological, like the hormones, and mechanical, like the stresses applied that changes over time. And these stimuli produce, and these factors produces different stimuli regulating how much activation of the osteoclastic and the osteoblastic activity to cope with the demands needed at different ages, stresses applied to the bone. So at the end of my presentation, my take home messages is that macroscopically we have two types of bone, compact and trabecular bone. Each has a different modulus of elasticity to meet its functional demands. Bone is a composite material. It's formed of an inorganic material, which is mainly collagen type 1, present to antagonize the tensile forces, organic material, which is mainly the calcium phosphate crystals, present to antagonize the compression forces. However, bone is weakest in torsion, and that's what we name bone is anisotropic, and it responds differently to different rate of loading, so it's viscoelastic also. Bone is in a dynamic state of change with a continuous state of remodeling. And remember that this remodeling is under the coupling mechanism between the osteoblasts, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Thank you.